next paper is the economics uh, of the Fed put, and uh, Annette Wissing Jorgensen presents it. Thanks very much. Is my microphone on? Can you guys hear me? Pretty good? All right, the guys will manage it. Um, I thought if I ran around a bit, then I could keep everyone awake. So uh, this is a, a joint work with Anna, just like who said Duke. This is on the Fed put, by which I mean strong monetary policy accommodation following stock market declines. So uh, we are, sorry, it's eating half of my, my uh, header there. It's all right. Um, we're interested in figuring out how much monetary policy reacts to the stock market. We're going to focus on the Federal Reserve. And we're interested in both how much uh, the Fed accommodates stock market slumps, but also how much it might lean against the win in stock market booms. And of course, how much, the pol how much policy should react to the stock market. Um, these are long-standing questions. Given the size of the stock market, of course, this is a, potentially a big deal in terms of the stock market driving the economy, driving policy. Uh, there are some identification challenges, which is that you know, not only does the Fed potentially uh, react to the stock market, it may also affect the stock market. So you can think of sort of a demand supply system where if you can't get variation in demand, you can't identify supply and the other way around. So on top of that, then you have um, omitted variables concerns that both the stock market and interest rates may be reacting to under underlying um, macroeconomic news, so you have sort of the, wor the worst of both worlds. You have omitted variables as well as reverse causality. So the way that people have addressed this in the literature is uh, there's a sort of a, a very clever identification by Hedo's skeleticity approach that Viggo and Sack have uh, promoted, which is essentially, if you think again about a demand and supply diagram, if you can get one of the curves to move around a lot, then you can identify the slope of the other one. So there, essentially, they say whenever the stock market is very volatile, then that changes the covariance between the stock market and interest rates in a way that will allow you to identify how much the central bank reacts to the stock market. So this works well if the policy shocks are homoscedastic so that it's only the stock market volatility that changes over time and parameters are stable across regimes. Another approach uh, promoted by Bernanke and Girdler has been to look into whether the stock market is significant in a Taylor rule above and beyond controls for central bank expectations for growth and employment and inflation. Um, there you have the advantage that you could to some extent overcome the omitted variable problem by including the expectations, the green book variables, in the sense that those presumably are sufficient statistics for how the macroeconomy macro is doing and so nothing sort of should be significant above and beyond those controls. Now there are some concerns with these approaches. So Morton Brown has a paper where he tries to figure out if central banks have, a, uh, specifically the Fed has an asymmetric response to the stock market using this identification to hit skepticity and finds that the results are very sensitive to sort of specific identifying assumptions. In terms of the, the stock returns and the Taylor rules, um, that approach is sort of helpful for figuring out for whether the central bank might be overreacting to the stock market. It's not as helpful for figuring out whether it's reacting to the stock market in the sense that you could have that the stock market is sort of a really strong driver of the Fed's growth, ex growth forecast, which then in turn drives policy. You can't see that from just running a regression where you add the stock market into a Taylor rule. Uh, furthermore, uh, some questions that these approaches are not designed to answer is how important is the stock market relative to other potential drivers of policy, and also what is the economics behind any impact of the stock market on policy? What is the, what is the, what is the Fed thinking as it potentially is reacting to the stock market? Is it about investment, consumption? You know, what are the, what are the underlying uh, economics? So we're going to focus on these um, four research questions uh, based on what I, what I laid out with some of the shortcomings of existing approaches. First, I'm going to just do statistics. We're going to run this predictive regressions and see, look, does it look like the Fed accommodates following low stock market returns or following high numbers for initial jobless claims, just to get a sense of, okay, is this, does it seem like, at least statistically, that this is the first sort of thing to think about, that the Fed might be reacting to the stock market? Then we're going to argue causality and mechanism by textual analysis. We're going to, uh, with the help of lots of Python code, uh, read a bunch of FOMC minutes and transcripts. The basic idea will be that 
if the Fed is reacting costly to the stock market, it better be the case that they talk a lot about the stock market after it's gone down. You could think of this as sort of a necessary condition for causality. If they never talked about the stock market, then presumably it could not be uh, causing their thinking. In terms of mechanism, we're going to look for what are they talking about in the same context that they talk about the stock market. So we'll look at sort of paragraphs where they talk about the stock market. What sort of stuff are they talking about in this paragraph relative, sort of disproportionately relative to what they generally are talking about? We look, are they talking more about consumption, investment, and so forth in the context of their stock market discussions? And then we'll have various, various approaches to discuss whether the Fed, uh, if by then I've convinced you that they are reacting to the stock market, whether they're overreacting or whether they're reacting appropriately. So. You guys are more of a monetary policy crowd. For the asset prices, let me just show you a couple of slides to convince you that really understanding whether and why the Fed reacts to the stock market is really also of first order importance for asset pricing. So this will also give me a chance to show you a slide or two from our earlier work, which will uh, show you why we got into thinking about this Fed put. So um, Anna and I have an earlier paper with uh, Adair Morris where we argue that you know, not only, as we'll focus on in the con current context, does it seem like the Fed is reacting to the stock market, but also it's driving the stock market. So it turns out that, let me show you the picture here, that uh, if you do an event study relative to the day of the FOMC meeting and you keep track of the five-day return on the stock market, then there's this very weird pattern that in even weeks, in what we call FOMC cycle time, the stock market has done very well. So we argue in that earlier work that this is actually the Fed driving the stock market. We have various approaches to, uh, to document that that's a, a causal impact of the Fed on the stock market. It doesn't line up with any other calendars to the extent that there's intermediate target changes. They tend to be in these even weeks. Um, Fed fund futures on average go down in these even weeks. And then also we link the even weeks with high returns um, to some actual decision making or discussions inside the Federal Reserve, specifically the Board of Governors board meetings. Now, what's also interesting is that in that earlier work, we find what you might call a Fed put in stock returns. So if you sort on the axis, look at the left picture, which is for even week days. If you sort uh, days in even weeks based on how well has the stock market done over the past five days. So has it been a good week or a bad week? Uh, let's just do five quintiles based on that. When you see really high one day returns in these even weeks, that's the point up to the uh, left top, is when last week was a really bad week. And today is one of those even weeks where we argue that the Fed is doing its thinking. And so that suggests that or that shows that um, strong monetary policy combination follows poor stock market performance, but it doesn't tell us whether the Fed is reacting to the stock market directly or whether the stock market perhaps just goes down when <coughs> growth news or unemployment news comes out negatively. So it's helpful for understanding, you know, document that the Fed is driving the stock market, but it's not helpful for understanding whether the Fed is directly reacting to the stock market. So that's what we'll dig into here. Um, that's the title, the economics of the Fed put. Now, in terms of the main findings, um, I'm going to try to convince you that negative stock returns are a very powerful predictor statistically of changes in the Fed funds target. It's as powerful as most macroeconomic indicators out there. And then I'm going to, as I said, do this causality and mechanism by textual analysis. What will come out of this is that the stock market seems to cause Fed policy and that the key uh, mechanism behind this is that the Fed has a strong belief in a consumption wealth effect. Okay, so when the stock market goes down, households are losing wealth and that causally drives their consumption. In turn, it drives the Fed's growth forecast and through that, in a standard Taylor framework, the Fed's policy rate. And there's not going to be a lot of evidence, actually, that the Fed is overreacting to the stock market. We'll have some details there. OK, so let's uh, take a deep breath and let's just take a look at what does this Fed put, like, put look like in the Fed funds target. OK, so before I showed you a Fed put in stock returns, uh, here's the sort of standard Fed put in the Fed funds rate target. So 
To the left, I'm using data since 1994 up to the zero lower bound. Uh, to the right, data from before 1994. The fat put shows up in the, from sometime in the mid-90s. I'm using the 94 cutoff just because that's what we had done in earlier work. But um, again, I'm sorting on the x-axis on how well has the stock market done in the recent past. Here I'm sorting on how well it's done since the last FOMC meeting. And then on the y-axis, I'm keeping track of how much does the target change, either over one cycle, a one FOMC cycle, a period, a two cycles, or so forth. The most uh, useful dot is the orange dot in the bottom left. That's a change over a one-year period. The interpretation is that if the stock market in the intermediate period has been in the lowest quintile, that's about a loss of 7%, then over the next year, the Fed statistically, or in a predictive way, um, has lowered the target by more than 100 basis points. You, that's there in the post-94 period, but not before. That split in terms of the timing will show up in our textual analysis. I'm going to show you that they start talking a lot about the stock market in the middle of the 1990s. Now, if you run this as a regression, just in terms of R squared, again, so far it's just statistics. Um, Let's run the change in the Fed funds rate on two lags. That's the first column. You get an R squared of 35%. Then in column three, um, let's add in the stock market return over the intermediate period, as well as one lag of that. I'm putting a minus here to indicate that I'm interested in, I'll call this my Fed put variable. It just means that in the regression, I'm only using the variation in the right-hand side variable over the negative range, arguing that there particularly uh, sensitive to negative news. You can see now the R squared goes up here to 51%, so a substantial increase in R squared. We'll look at that incremental R squared uh, next for macroeconomic variables, and we'll be able to compare how much incremental R squared do we get out of the stock market versus how much we got out of various macro indicators such as ISM or non-farm payroll and so forth. So. The statistical relation documented here is something that the Fed has come under criticism for. A former governor, Kevin Warsh, uh, I put aside here, says, they look to me asset price dependent more than they look economic data dependent. When the stock market falls like it did in the beginning of this year, they say, oh, we better not do anything. Now, this suggested that this reaction, this statistical predictability of policy is a problem. Uh, we'll have to dig into whether that is a problem. We're gonna be, I think when all is said and done, um, much more on the Fed side of this, that given a strong consumption wealth effect, then it is actually rational to react to the stock market. But let's take a look at how much incremental predictive power we get out of the, the competitors sort of to the stock market, namely all these uh, macroeconomic indicators. So we took data from, uh, for all the main macro releases in Bloomberg. Uh, there's about 38 of those. And we ran the same two regressions that I just talked you through. First, just the change in the Fed funds target on two lags. And then second, the same thing, add in some, in this case, macro data. Um, there's some missing data dummies, just disregard those. Then in the column that says incremental R squared, you can see how much extra predict predictive power we get out of the stock market. That's the number that I just talked you through. The sample here, the number is slightly different from the two numbers I showed you before because the sample only starts in 96 as opposed to 94. The main point here is if you take a look at the other data, which is all macro releases, then you get smaller incremental R squared. The point here is not that the stock market is slightly better than the macro release, but that the stock market incremental R squared seems to be pretty large relative to most macroeconomic news. You can even take, in the spirit of um, combining macro data, you could put in uh, the, here at the bottom, the Chicago Fed National Activity Index. That's the first principal component of, a whole, you know, about 100, as far as I remember, uh, macro series. Even then, you only get to about 12.9% incremental R squared. So it seems like this, from a statistical perspective, the stock, the, the stock market is a good predictor of Fed policy. So hopefully, that will make you more interesting in what I'm going to say next. So there's two ways that this could work out. Either the stock market causes policy by which I mean that it drives the economy, for example, through the consumption wealth effect. Uh, 
or because it's just a great sufficient statistic for predicting the way things are going. Okay, both of those I'm going to classify in the causal category where rational fats should pay attention to the stock market. I want to first distinguish that causal uh, bullet point from the coincidental one, which is that the Fed really doesn't care at all about the stock market. It just happens that the stock market does poorly when, say, unemployment goes up and the Fed cares about unemployment. And I already uh, talked you through what is the main, there's really sort of just one idea in the paper, which is, you know, you have a decision maker that writes down how it thinks. Let's look at what they're saying. And first, uh, we're going to do this to figure out if they talk a lot about the stock market after it's gone down. We're going to do that first by reading it manually and then by Python code. Then we're going to do, do textual analysis one more time, reading manually what's the mechanism and also coding uh, with Python code what they're talking about. So here's the text that you get to work with. So the FOMC meetings are highly scripted. First the staff talks. Then the policymakers, which are called the participants in Fed terminology, uh, they talk and then there is the, the decision. Now we're going to study the meeting, the minutes. There's a textual analysis choice to be done here. One is you could say you could use the, the statement, but that's kind of too short in order for there to be much discussion of how they reach their decision, so it's not the best possible text. You could say, well, what about the transcripts? Well, there you get almost too much text. You get two to 300 pages per meeting. It's not structured in the sense that one guy might ramble along about the stock market for 20 pages. So the minutes, we think, is probably the best text. You get seven to 10 pages uh, per meeting. And also, the minutes are available up to the end of the, you know, up to currently. So you, you don't have this lag that you get with the transcripts where there's a five-year delay. Nonetheless, I'm going to also look at the transcripts for robustness as we get into the numbers here. So, we, did, we, uh, we have all the text in the minutes, and then we look for the word stock market. And it turns out that there's many different ways they say stock market, but just so you can get a sense of how many counts we have here. So in the period since 1994, in the second line from the bottom, um, we have eight minutes per year, so we have 184 minutes in total. And we get, they're seven to 10 pages long, we get about a thousand mentions of the stock market. Now what we want to, here's a time series. Um, notice, I don't know if you can see the dot here, it actually does work suddenly now. Um, here's the mid 90s. There's not, with the exception of the 87 stock market crash, there's not a lot of talk about the stock market before the mid 90s. And then it, there's sort of consistent attention being paid to the stock market after that. <laughs> Notice that that's actually pretty consistent with that Fed put only showing up in the pre-94 period in my graph before and not in, in the post-94 period, not in the pre-94 period. Now we're going to, that's the transcript you get basically the same. Okay, so of these thousand mentions of the stock market, half of them are kind of uninteresting. Um, at the FOMC meeting, staff summarize the financial situation and it's someone's job to say how well the stock market is doing, so that's not as interesting. More interestingly, there's 272 cases where the participants, and again, those are the decision makers, the chair, the vice chair, the governors, the regional Fed presidents, where they talk about the stock market. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to read these about a thousand paragraphs to figure out whether they're talking about the market going up or down. And then here's a time series of them talking about the market going down. Now the little uh, red triangles, that indicates that the intermediate stock return was in the lowest quintile. And so what you want to see is a lot of red triangles at the top of the spikes. That means that they are expressing more concern about the stock market after it had, has actually gone down. And you can see that they are sort of the well-known cases, the Lehman and so forth. Uh, the positive mentions are not as interesting. The Relation between the intermediate stock return and then the counts, we did here, a, again, a bucketing by the variable on the x-axis. You can see the relation here a little bit better than you could in the time series picture. When the stock market does poorly, they talk more about the stock market having done poorly and conversely on the upside. Most interestingly, you can actually uh, predict the changes in the target based on how much concern they express about the stock market at the meeting. 
So let's focus on uh, the first column is all stock market mentions. The more interesting one is probably column three, where it's the stock market mentions by the decision makers. You, the pink, uh, let me just give you here the, the terminology here. When it says number stocks M minus, that means the number of stock market mentions um, that are concerned about the market going down. Okay, so the minus refers to them being concerned about it going down, whereas plus refers to them talking about the market going up. Now, if you look at column three, you can see that the, the stars are all on the minus variables. So that says when they talk about the stock market going down, then they follow through and lower the target. When they talk about the stock market going up, you know, that's all talk. It doesn't have any impact on the target. So in that sense, you can see here the, what you could see, you could call the a fat put in the tax zone analysis which lines up quite well with what we saw first in the stock market and in the target and now in the text. And I put the economic significance down here. A one sigma increase in negative stock market mentions means they lower the target by about uh, 34 basis points cumulatively over the next few meetings. Now we want to be, uh, we want to check that this is robust using the transcript. So we teach Python to think like an economist um, in the sense that we want to tell the, the code, okay, look for the word stock market or the phrase stock market, and then look for whether it says going up or going down, you know, near the phrase stock market. That's a little harder than it sounds. There's a lot of different ways you can say stock market. There's many different ways you can say down and many different ways you can say up. But once you have trained the code uh, on the minutes, where you have already read it manually and you know, you know what the paragraph is saying, you can then run the same stuff in the transcript and you get similar relations. All right, so that was the, the conclusion for, on question two on causality. We believe that the, the Fed is reacting causally to the stock market because they talk more about, they do talk a lot about the stock market at the meetings, especially when the market has gone down and you can predict changes in the target with how much they talk about the market going down. So, moving on to our third question about the mechanism. Um, we first take those thousand paragraphs. Now we read them one more time to figure out what they're talking about other than the market going up or down. So, here's a list of ways in which they talk about the stock market. So, the first kind is not that interesting. This is an example of a purely descriptive mention where they, they say broad US equity price indices were highly correlated with foreign indices over the intermediate period and posted net declines. Fine, that was some staffers' job to describe how things are going. The more interesting ones are the ones that give some specific economic context. So here's one saying consumer spending had held up reasonably well in recent months despite a variety of adverse developments, including the negative wealth effect of stock market declines. And Example of an investment I mentioned would be here yeah, many businesses also were inhibited in their investment activities by less accommodated financial conditions associated with weaker equity markets and tighter credit, credit terms. That allows investment was being cancelled. Okay, then there's some where they talk about demand without specifying, specifying whether it's consumption or investment. There's some where they talk about the stock market as being one of several uh, financial conditions. Uh, generally, when they talk about financial conditions, they talk about interest rates, both long and short. They talk about the dollar, they talk about credit conditions, and they talk about the stock market. I'll show you textual analysis count for the other financial conditions later on. The reason we focus on the stock market here is because that's, the, that's where there's some, something new going on from the mid-90s. They start focusing on the stock market, whereas the other financial conditions that I mentioned, they have been focusing on sort of throughout the period uh, since the early 80s where we have data for. Um, the one that I had expected to see a lot of was that the stock market is just a good predictor of the economy. And we tried really, really hard to, look, to find words saying that. I found one here saying a broad decline in stock price and interest rate over the intermediate period was seen as mostly reflecting the incoming data, pointing to a weaker outlook for growth. Okay, I was expecting to find hundreds of these and we can barely find any. Um, let me save you the weeks of reading paragraphs. Um, look at the column with the red numbers for uh, our reading of the 272 paragraphs where some of the decision makers, the participants, talk about the stock market. What are they talking about? 
consumption. Okay, so out of 272, 150 um, are cases where they talk about uh, stock market in the context of the consumption wealth effect. 29 is about investment, 40 about financial conditions, but, but almost none, 12, are the cases where the stock market is being mentioned simply because it's a good predictor of the economy. Okay, so they think the stock market is driving the economy as opposed to just predicting it, and that's uh, due to a belief in a, in a solid consumption wealth effect. Here's a couple of quotes, just so you don't think I made this up. Uh, Bill, Bill Dudley, uh, the former head of the new, president of New York Fed, saying that a rise in equity prices can boost household wealth, which is one factor that underpins consumer spending. Uh, Richard Fisher, former Dallas Fed president, saying that uh, they front-loaded at the Fed an enormous rally in order to accomplish a wealth effect. So you might uh, be a little skeptical that and once I had read a hundred of those paragraphs, I was just looking for the word consumption. Um, so we did a, some Python code here to try to more systematically look at what else is being mentioned in the context of consumption. And let me just show you here what happens for the participants. So we look for all economic concepts. We make our own dictionary of economic concepts and we see what's dis disproportionately being mentioned in the context of uh, a stock market mention, and it's we sort then by the economic cons concept that disproportionately are being mentioned in that context, and the stuff that shows up is really all consumption related. Okay, so this was sort of the Python code check on the reading of the paragraphs. All right, so finally, the fourth question remember was whether the Fed is overdoing it, and we're going to have three approaches. We're going to compare the updating of the Fed screen book uh, or teal book forecast for growth and inflation to see if the Fed upgrade, updates their expectations more aggressively than the private sector. We're also going to look at how much actual predictive power there is of the stock market for growth and inflation. The second approach will be the Taylor rule approach. And the third one will be to look at whether consumers worry about the stock market when the Fed does. And by all counts, the Fed is going to look actually pretty rational. So here's the the updating of the Green Book forecast in response to the stock market. So this, this is a constant calendar quarter. So think about Q0 as the current quarter. You had some expectation about growth in that quarter before this FMC meeting, so at the last FMC meeting. Then since the last meeting, we get some incoming data in the stock market. We update our thinking about the same quarter. Okay, we update our thinking about Q0, Q1, Q2, and Q3. I'm going to add them up. So this is an updating in growth over the next year. There's some gradual reaction to the stock market. If you sum up those coefficients, you get basically 10. So focusing on the pink lines. Um, the interpretation of this is that if the market drops by 10%, then they lower the growth expectation by about one percentage point. For unemployment, they lower in column three uh, the unemployment expectation one year out by about a half percentage point. Okay, so just remember the numbers 10 and 5. Okay, they update growth expectation 10, unemployment 5. Here, inflation, there's basically nothing going on. Here's the private sector updating. Look at the red line, 9 and 5. Okay, this is from the SPF. So pretty similar. If you do the, uh, the blue chip, you get 6 and 4. A little lower, but not much. Notice also that if you, let's go back to the Fed, if you look at the numbers from in columns two and four from, bef from the pre-94 period, you don't see much updating. Okay, so you get a consistent pattern that before 1994 they were just not paying attention to the stock market, not in their minutes, not in people talking, not in the target, not in the growth updating, and then after 94, the whole thing changes. Notice again also the, the put shape showing up. There's no statistical impact of the, the, in the positive range of the stock market. So when the market goes down, they downgrade the expectation. When the market goes up, they have an asymmetric response. In terms of the actual predictability, um, you get, look at the top left, you get basically 10. Okay, for, un for unemployment, column four, you get six. 
for the Fed we had 10 and 5. It's all looking pretty consistent. So based on this first approach, um, the Fed is looking pretty rational. The second approach was the Taylor rule. So um, column one is just the change in the Fed funds target on some lags. You've seen that one before. Column two, we use an information criteria to pick out which variable wants to enter the Taylor rule, growth, inflation, unemployment. And then column three, we do the horse race. And you can see that in the pink and, and darker pink uh, rows that once you put in the growth and inflation data, in particular the growth is what matters here, the coefficient on the stock market becomes almost insignificant. And also in row one, the autocorrelation is a lot lower actually. So if you, if you uh, calculate out how much economic predictive power is there of the stock market once you put in the green book, the green book expectations, there's not much. So a 10% drop in the stock market, as we saw in the very, very first graph on the, on the target, moves the target by about 100 basis points cumulatively. Uh, without the green book controls, once you put those in, you're down to 21. It turns out actually that consistent with this asymmetric thinking. In column four, if you allow the Fed to react asymmetrically to growth, so more, it turns out it reacts more to low growth and to high growth, then the stock market is no longer significant. So in that sense, the Fed is looking pretty rational. Yeah, so let me show you just my final. There's various reasons it could be rational to react to the stock market above and beyond growth, but since I don't, that's not as interesting. Let me just show you how much the, this is how much the Michigan Survey Consumers guy, guys uh, care about the, or, this is how many of those Michigan respondents say we have heard about some concerning economic news and it's about the stock market. Okay, so this is the household's concern about the stock market. Let me just overlay here the Fed's concern about the stock market. Let me do this again just because it's fun. Uh, the correlation is 0.68. Okay, so again the household is worried about the stock market as the Fed, so overall the Fed is looking pretty good. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the other counts and look forward to many of comments. Emanuel Mensch. Just stand still. Thank you. So, uh, the second one. So thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to discuss this uh, really interesting paper. It had been some time that I wanted to read it, so this was a good commitment device to finally sit down and do it. Um, I, I'm a central banker, so there's a disclaimer uh, on the slide. So uh, this is a really interesting paper uh, that studies uh, not just one, but a set of important questions. Um, the paper contains, as you could see, uh, contains lots of results, uh, many of which I won't be able to do justice uh, today in my discussion. So I will really just focus on uh, primarily the first question that Annette and, and Anna uh, raised, which is whether uh, the stock market predicts uh, Fed decisions uh, relative to, to other, uh, other uh, news about the macroeconomy. Um, among other things, the paper uses uh, textual analysis on FOMC minutes and transcripts, so there's really a, a, a new innovative methodology aspect to the paper, which I liked a lot. Um, uh, the main conclusion of the paper is that the, um, the stock market causes Fed policy, and, and if confirmed, uh, I think this is an, a really um, important result. Uh, the outline of my uh, uh, discussion will be, I will first very briefly summarize the paper, and then I have essentially three comments or questions. Um, uh, the first question is, uh, I want to challenge a little bit uh, the authors uh, about the systematicness of the Fed's response to the stock market. Um, uh, then I want to ask whether um, it is really about stock returns in particular or financial or economic conditions more broadly uh, that the Fed cares about, uh, and the stock market being one indicator of those, of course. Uh, and then I have a comment on the econometrics. On the 
so let me jump right in. Uh, so the paper studies the relation between the stock market and stock market outcomes and, and Fed policy. Uh, the key findings are, uh, um, and Annette did a really nice job summarizing the results, so I'll just uh, go through uh, the four bullet points that sort of is my read of the main results. Um, the key findings are that uh, the federal funds rate is or federal funds rate cuts uh, are predicted by very low stock returns uh, in preceding uh, FOMC cycles. Um, this is interpreted uh, uh, as the Fed cushioning equities in bull markets. Uh, and so um, uh, Annette and Anna call this the Fed put. Um, the stock market mentions in FOMC meetings um, by uh, uh, staff, Fed staff, but also by uh, FOMC participants, predict target rate changes. Uh, and the reason for this uh, um, uh, is that uh, the FOMC believes in, in something like a wealth effect. Okay, let me jump into my comments right away. Uh, so the first uh, question is, is this really a systematic reaction that the Fed shows to stock market downturns? Uh, when you look at the sample period that uh, Anna and Annette consider, you see that there's essentially, here I'm plotting the uh, Fed funds rate from 1994 onwards up until 2016. The main part of the analysis focused on the sample 1994 to 2008. Uh, what you see is that there's essentially only two easing cycles over that sample. Uh, and so. Uh, over this uh, uh, period, uh, uh, Annette uh, and Anna identify a Fed reaction to the stock market. And, and uh, the two easing cycles uh, um, in the sample were 2001, which was essentially just after the, uh, uh, the dot-com bubble burst, um, and uh, 2007, 2008, so uh, essentially the, financial, the, the uh, financial crisis and the ensuing uh, global, the Great Recession. Um, so, not surprisingly, both of these years, 2001 and 2008, are highly inferential for the document relation between negative stock returns and future Fed runs rate changes. So, uh, Annette was uh, so kind as to send me the data, so I, I dug in a little bit. Uh, and here I'm just showing basically uh, uh, the first set of regressions uh, on, on an annual basis. Uh, uh, on the left, we have the Fed funds rate changes uh, uh, on average over a given year. Uh, 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 on the right, we have the, uh, the Fed put variable, the negative stock return accrued over that uh, same year, uh, or the previous uh, year's uh, FOMC cycles, I should say. And what you see is that basically this negative relationship, uh, this positive relationship is really, uh, seems to be driven to some extent by the 2008 and 2001 observations. Uh, and so uh, when, you, when you exclude those two years, and I'm not saying uh, uh, you should exclude those years, but just as an observation, if you exclude those two years, then uh, the uh, relationship seems to be gone. So these two years, uh, um, which have seen uh, important uh, 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 financial crises, if you will, the burst of the dot-com bubble uh, is at least an important financial market event, uh, and the financial crisis uh, is an important financial market event. Uh, when you exclude those two years, uh, there doesn't seem to be much of a systematic relationship between stock returns and, and the, and the, and the Fed's, uh, uh, Fed policy. Um, now, looking at individual meetings, uh, we see that there's particular meetings that seem to be very influential for this uh, uh, documented relationship, uh, and those are the meetings on uh, March 20th, uh, 2001, and uh, October 29, 2008. So, um, so what was going on? on those days. Uh, let's, let's ask the FOMC. So um, just reading uh, uh, from the FOMC minutes on, uh, for March 20, 2001, uh, we see that uh, the members saw clear downside risks in the outlook for consumer investment spending in the context of the market decline that had occurred in equity prices and consumer confidence and in expected business profitability. And they were concerned that weaker exports might also hold down the expansion of economic activity. Uh, uh, the uh, minutes from October 29, 2008, um, we all know this is a couple of weeks after Lehman came down, but here is a nice summary of what had happened actually over this period. A number of adverse financial developments influenced economic and financial market conditions over the intermediate period. Lehman Brothers Holdings had filed for bankruptcy the day before the meeting of the committee in September, in large part because of losses on Lehman debt, the net asset value of a major money market fund fell below uh, $1 per share, spurring a substantial outflow from money market mutual funds and straining their liquidity. The rapid deterioration 
creation of AIG and Wachovia, along with the closing of Washington Mutual, led to intensified market concerns about the condition of financial institutions. And now importantly, in this environment, investors pulled back from risk-taking, funding markets for terms beyond overnight largely ceased to function at times, credit risk spreads rose sharply, and equity prices registered steep declines. So does the FOMC only care about the stock market when deciding on policy rates in times of crisis? According to these minutes, uh, clearly not. Uh, there's at least in, only in these two meetings minutes, there's a number of other variables that are mentioned, consumer confidence, expected business profitability, exports, funding markets for terms beyond overnight, credit risk spreads, and so on, and so on. So I think to show that the FOMC reacts to the stock market over and above other economic and financial conditions, one needs to show that the stock market put variable survives when controlling for all these other indicators. Uh, and the authors are aware of this issue, uh, so um, they, they do control for economic, macroeconomic news. Unfortunately, they only study the predictive content of the put variable for federal funds rate changes in comparison to and not together with macro news. And uh, in these regressions, uh, and Annette showed the results, uh, they find strong evidence that this, the put variable is stronger than a host of individual macro news. But we, we know that the stock market is a good information aggregator, so I'm not quite sure what, to, uh, what we learn from this regression, just comparing our squares of, of regressions of the federal funds rate changes on past stock market returns in comparison and not jointly with uh, macroeconomic news. So let's just, um, and that gets me to my, my second point, whether uh, the relationship that uh, uh, Annette and Anna document uh, uh, is really about uh, stock returns in particular, or financial and economic conditions more, more broadly. So let's jointly consider economic and financial conditions in, in the federal funds rate uh, prediction. Uh, for example, let's use consumer confidence and credit spreads as additional regresses, and those were two of the variables that were mentioned in the minutes uh, of these important events. Uh, uh, and so specifically, I replicate one of the regressions from the paper uh, of uh, changes in the federal funds rate uh, target on a given uh, FOMC date on uh, two lags of that same variable, and then uh, the uh, um, stock market put variable, so the negative of the accrued stock returns in the uh, previous uh, in the meeting period and its and its lag, and then I will add to this regression consumer confidence news. Uh, and uh, a, a variable that essentially measures uh, the increase in credit spreads over the intermediate period. And I will, just to be able to uh, compare this uh, with the, uh, the other sort of regresses, I will also uh, include the lags as regresses. And then I will just compare the slope coefficients for the stock market put variable and its lags before and after adding these, these additional variables. So importantly, macro news uh, are only available uh, from 1996, November onwards. So just to confirm that the put variable alone remains strongly significant in the post-November 96 sample. Uh, uh, I just run the regression without adding consumer confidence and, and, and the credit spread. So uh, uh, the put variable on the left and then the, its lag, uh, uh, they, they, they survive over that sample, so that's important. Now adding consumer confidence and the BAA spread, the put variable largely loses its significance. So this tells us that essentially when you add other measures of economic and financial conditions, uh, that probably the Fed cares about. The put variable, the stock return, the negative stock returns accrued over the intermediate period don't seem to be all that important. It's slightly uh, statistically significant at the 10% level um, uh, uh, for, the, for the lag, but uh, uh, it, it really becomes much weaker. When you add other measures of financial uh, economic conditions, for example, the Philly Fed business outlook, which also is a strong predictor of Fed funds rate news, there's essentially no explanatory power left. So this is just to basically say that uh, I think stock market downturns are, are one of many indicators that the FOMC considers. Uh, I don't really see strong evidence here that uh, it has a particularly important role for Fed decisions, uh, the stock market. Um, um, there's uh, two little uh, quibbles also um, uh, that I just wanted to highlight. Much of the explanatory power of the put variable actually doesn't come from the accrued negative stock returns in the intermediate period, but this lag. So this means that the the negative stock returns between the second to last and the last FOMC meeting predict target rate changes today. Uh, and I can't possibly think of a good story why this would be the case, so I'd be curious to hear Annette's thoughts on this. Uh, moreover, this lag put variable interacts strongly with the second lag of the Fed funds rate change, so the dependent variable, that also enters the regressions, and I, I couldn't think of a rationale for having sort of two lags of the Fed funds rate uh, change uh, in, the, in the regression. So this is just 
just a minor thing. Final comment uh, on the econometrics. The put variable that is used throughout the paper is defined as the minimum uh, between the accrued intermediate uh, stock market return and zero. Uh, so this variable uh, is essentially a truncated censored variable. So more than half of the observations in the 94 to 2008 sample are, are zero of this variable. And now we know from Rigobon and Stoker, uh, they have a number of papers on this, that a linear regression with censored explanatory variable, uh, variables leads to bias and efficiency loss. And uh, Rigobon and Stoker in the 2007 paper put this nicely. So they say, if one ignores the censored nature of a regressor, then one can induce a particularly insidious practical problem, namely estimates that are too large. The phenomenon, which we term expansion bias, can give a spurious impression of the importance of a regressor. Uh, and so uh, quite ironically, they actually label this expansion bias uh, in the context uh, of, uh, of this. So a nice way to actually document or, or illustrate the, the issue that can arise if you have a censored uh, right inside variable is, is from this uh, Rigobon and Stoker uh, paper. Um, if you basically have a, a lot of observations uh, that you truncate at a given, at a given value, uh, in, their, in their example it's 80, but in, in, in Annette and Anna's paper it's zero, uh, then you can basically uh, find a, a larger uh, regression slope than might actually be in the, continuous, in the continuously uh, uh, registered variables. So that's a, a, a potential econometric issue that I think uh, uh, Annette and Anna would might, uh, might want to look into. Um, turns out the dependent variable, the Fed funds rate change, also has many zeros, uh, even though it's not zero, uh, censored. It's basically oftentimes the, the Fed doesn't change policy rates. Uh, a question that uh, uh, um, I, I had and couldn't answer immediately was whether this amplifies the expansion bias that uh, Rigobon Stoker um, 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 mentioned or whether this potentially mis mitigates it. Uh, it could go both ways, I think. Um, Rigobon Stoker also characterized the efficiency loss in linear regression with censored regression and propose a maximum likely estimator, maximum likelihood estimator for a normal mixed censoring model. So that's maybe something the authors could consider as a robustness check. Uh, they also characterize the bias in linear regression with censored regresses in their follow-up paper. And it seems to be just taking a quick look at that, at that paper that the bias can be particularly large or, or gross with uh, the number of zeros you, you have in your right inside variable. And here again, it's, uh, it's, it's more than 50%. So potentially there is, there is a risk of a bias here. So the authors may want to make sure that the censoring doesn't unduly affect, uh, affect their results. So with this, let me summarize and conclude. This is a really interesting paper, uh, studies uh, an important question or studies important questions. Uh, the findings suggest that uh, there is an asymmetry in the Fed's response to stock price fluctuations. In my view, uh, the jury is still out as to how important the stock market really is as a predictor and if it is important in and of itself or simply as a proxy for broader financial and economic conditions. And I encourage everyone to read the paper to form their own views. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Um, Annette, you want to add? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, I agree that we only have two crashes in the stock market between 94 and 2008. Um, one of the reasons we started looking at not only the Fed funds target, but how much the Fed drives the stock market was precisely, so in our first paper, was precisely to get more high frequency evidence. So in the picture that I showed you uh, from the stock market, I showed you weekly stock returns, and then I showed you today's stock market return in even weeks. And that uh, graph we are able to run all the way up to, you know, currently. That gives us more data, both in the sense that it's more high frequency, but also because we have data out, you know, during a zero lower bond period. So it turns out the Fed put as measured by whether the stock market mean reverts in even weeks is, if anything, stronger in the zero lower bond period before. So that gives us a little bit more data. In, if you think about the recent history, one of the, case, one of the cases where the Fed really got busted in the financial press for acting like it reacted to the stock market was in 2015 when they delayed liftoff because the stock market tanked due to fears about growth in China. You may remember that event. So I agree that we only have as much data as we have, but by looking not only at the target, but also at the stock market, we can do a little bit better. Another thing about, um, that's useful is that in a text or an analysis, right, you can follow from week to week or from meeting to meeting how much to talk about the stock market. That also gives you more high frequency identification than just looking at those two, um, two 
this two stock market crashes, but you know, I agree that those are going to be driving things. That's going to be true regardless of what explanatory variable you have, how it lines up in 2001 and 2008 is going to matter. Um, in terms of other financial conditions, I didn't have a chance to show you, but we have graphs for that in the paper, and I completely agree that they likely care about other financial conditions. Um, as I said, the main ones they care about are short and long rates, credit spreads, the dollar. The reason, as I said before, that we focus on the stock market is that that's the one where there's something new going on. They start talking about that in the mid-90s, which is when we see the stock market put showing up, both in, in the target and the stock market in the textual analysis. So, um, in fact, the reason we started doing textual analysis was because we were running horse races. We thought, okay, they're caring about credit spreads, the dollar, the stock market. We started running horse races between these financial conditions variables. And with this, you know, with the one time series you have for the target, it's a statistical nightmare to sort this out. So then we said, well, at least these guys will tell you what they're thinking about. So let's figure out, okay, are they, what are they talking about when? And, and that gives you essentially more insights than just one linear regression. I don't think that just one regression is going to sort this out, but the text analysis hopefully will tell us that they care about a whole bunch of financial conditions, including the credit spreads and so forth. But what they newly care about in the period since 94 is the stock market. Um, in terms of the Wigmore Bond and SAC, we should definitely read that. Thank you for the reference. Uh, we have done as non-parametric relations as we could. That's why I showed you this bucket. I showed you graphs where I just had, here's quintiles of the stock market, and here is how the target changed. That was because we were also you know, concerned about what is the right functional form, and you saw that it was basically flat, except in the lowest quintile, which again tells you that you know, results are going to be sensitive to whether you, if you don't have any stock market crashes in the sample period, you, know, you cannot estimate the relation. So uh, thank you very much for the comments. And Hopefully you guys have some more questions. So there is uh, growing empirical evidence that uh, financial conditions affect uh, uh, the downside risk to economic growth, but not really the upside of the distribution. And so if you take uh, a risk management approach to monetary policy, whereby it's easier to react to booms than to busts, uh, this could provide an additional justification why they are so overreacting to stock prices. They're really reacting to stress to financial conditions that will transmit to uh, um, create a downside risk to, to, to growth and to the economy in general. Should I go? go. So uh, um, you went very fast. I want, if possible, uh, for you to talk a little bit more about what happens when you introduce growth uh, into the picture, because I was wondering what is your interpretation or, of the finding, if it's uh, that uh, mainly the Fed cares about the stock market as a predictor of future economic conditions that are not captured by the standard macroeconomic variable current, uh, sorry about, uh, or if something else you think uh, it's a beyond that, uh, something about uh, uh, the cons consumer sector reacting in a rational way to the stock market or things like that are beyond the uh, economic, even future economic conditions. Let me just reply to those two before I forget. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I agree about the downside risk. Um, I had one regression where I split up in the tail of rule growth into the positive range and the negative range, and definitely they react more consistent to the negative in, consistent with sort of a risk management approach. Um, Veronica, in terms of how they think about it, basically they think about, so here I'm going by Nariana Kochalkota's discussion and John Williams' comments, so basically they think about the stock market as a demand shock um, through the consumption wealth effect. And I think if you ask Bernanke, he would also say, perhaps also Gertler, uh, that uh, it would go through investments. That's, that's probably some of the investment mentions that we had. Um, consumption and investment both work their way into the growth forecast. And that's why you saw in my Taylor rules, once you put in the Fed's growth forecast, then the stock market was not doing much above and beyond that. Um, Fed thinks in terms of the wealth effect when they judge movements in the stock market and whether they should do anything. 
But I also think that they, uh, they don't believe that very high frequency movements in the stock market are going to have much effect on consumption. It's sort of large, persistent effects. So what that suggests is what Emmanuel was talking about. The, the two periods where your story makes the most sense are the 2001 drop and the 2008 uh, drop. And so here's a possibly half-baked thought. Um, compare your simple model over those two periods where you're going to pick up the drop in the rates associated to the stock market with Emmanuel's broader map model which chases out the stock market. And the question is how does Emmanuel's model do around that period? Does he miss the drop in interest rates? So if that's the case, what that would suggest is uh, maybe screening out small variation in the stock market and just kind of running a regression where you just look at big drops. Kind of. um, has the market uh, understood that the Fed reacts uh, to the stock market, uh, i.e. is the stock market a good driver of the expectations about uh, Fed decisions? And also quickly, um, what is the impact on the equity risk premium of the fact that the Fed reacts to the stock market? Um, There's another one with it. The U.S. has a very high uh, stock market participation, so the wealth effect is really pronounced. So it might be useful to look at some other countries where, you know, uh, the wealth effect is known not to be as important and see whether you pick something similar, which would then be indicative of whether you're picking up, you know, other non-genuine stock market effects or not. Let me just reply to this. Uh, thank you very much for the suggestion. Um, you had asked if the market understands the Fed put, and I would say, you know, not fully yet. I mean, if you track the number of media articles, it's growing over time. The reason I'm saying not fully yet is that even in the zero low bound period, it's still the case that if the stock market goes down, and today, if the stock market went down the, over the past week, and today is one of those even weekdays where we think the Fed does its decision, it's still the case that you see high stock returns, which you shouldn't see if everyone had caught up. So in that sense, it seems like the market is sort of catching up, but still ha the Fed has come out sort of more gung-ho than in its reaction to the stock market than the market had thought. This is a very important question in terms of moral hazard, of course, because once everyone becomes aware that there is this insurance, then you know bad things could start happening. But it doesn't seem like the market is fully caught up, at least not yet. Um, in terms of the, the equity risk premium, in our first paper, we we show that um, VIX moves exactly opposite to the stock market. And so if you use Ian Martin's equity premium estimate from the QJE paper, which is very highly correlated with VIX, um, what seemed to happen is that the way that the Fed increases the stock market following stock market declines is through a sharp reduction in the equity risk premium. And uh, we suspect that there is some element of whatever it takes in that, that the Fed comes out and says, look, we, in the Fed's terminology, is we stand ready to act as needed as opposed to do whatever it takes, but um, a similar effect. Um, uh, Refit, in terms of the comments on other countries, that's a great, that's a great comment. We had also checked uh, the housing mentions since if the Fed believes in wealth effects driving consumption, since the housing wealth effect is generally thought to be larger than the stock market wealth effect, they should talk about that as well. And they do in the housing crisis, but not, you know, that's also one of those that it's kind of new that they talk about it, consistent with them having started focusing more on wealth effects in, in recent years. Um, it would be interesting to see whether the ECB reacts strongly to the stock market, given that we saw that there was little relation between the stock market and inflation. You know, a central bank focusing more on an inflation mandate may want to react less strongly to the stock market than one without. So I suspect someone will check that going forward. Um, I think that was it. Another question there. Bernard. So this is a very interesting paper. 
Um, one question is what happened in 1994? Is it the fe Fed's reaction function, so Greenspan giving up on warning against irrational exuberance of markets and becoming a cheerleader for uh, the new economy and uh, then the credit and housing markets? Or is it something structural like uh, stock market participation or the wealth effect becoming more important? So maybe a bit of a storytelling about 90, uh, 1994. Um, your message is the Fed is pretty rational. Now which Fed, the early Fed, the late Fed? Um, some doubts on the house on the wealth effects. Uh, the work by John Muhlbauer and John Duker shows what really matters is disaggregation, so the debt and then housing and uh, financial wealth separately. Um, and then one hypothesis, uh, which goes a bit in the direction of Keynes and Shin and others, uh, the beauty contest. So what matters is not the wealth effect, it's just that some people believe there is some wealth effect, that's enough, which is a confidence effect really, not a wealth effect. Uh, and that brings me to the final thing, uh, Emmanuel's co-author, um, uh, Tobias Adrian, has uh, propagated this um, um, term structure of risk and the GDP at risk, which actually means that you should be most worried about financial conditions when they are actually buoyant, because that's a good predictor for a crisis in the medium term, a few years out. So how do you relate that? So it really would look, at, you should start to be worried about going, prices going up and not going down. So maybe the early Greenspan is right, not the, not the late Greenspan. So I close my remarks here. So in terms of why 1994, so in the actual data, the stock market is a perfectly good predictor of growth and unemployment, even all the way going back to 1947. So in that sense, it's the late Fed that's correct, not the early Fed. Um, my colleague Martin Lettow uh, gave me a little bit of the history of what exactly happened inside the Fed as to when they started focusing on this. And, and you may uh, remember the dates of the famous Letta Ludwigsen papers about the consumption wealth effect and the consumption wealth ratio predicting the stock market. Um, there was uh, some arguments between the New York Fed of Letta Ludwigsen and then the Greenspan Fed in Washington about the size of the consumption wealth effect, and you can follow that sort of in the various articles. And um, just one final comment. Um, in Narayana Kochalkota's discussion of his paper, it was interesting, he said the Fed actually hasn't gotten it right yet, because uh, if you see that the stock market is tanking, still predicts low growth, then we're not doing enough. So in his view, that should keep going until the predictive power of the stock market goes away. But I suspect there'll be some disagreement with that on the committee. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot to both the speakers. There is a coffee break now. Uh, please come back um, quarter, quarter to, to five. <laughs>